Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul has been trying to express that we, we only have one Father. And Father has written one message. It's the message of God, consisting of many books, but it's still the same message regardless of what book you read it from. And then these different preachers would bring forth the word and people were beginning to take up with preachers rather than with Christ. The one God sent to deliver the message, the word became flesh and walked among us. And Paul is trying to instill in them, hey, it all came from God, we're all ministers, and God gives gifts to some, it's all equal though because it all comes from God. So having said that, he continues that same message, chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, verse 1, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father. Let a man so account of us, that's to say, let, let everyone look at me, Paul, and Apollos, and Peter, Cephas, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In other words, God's secrets and truths, that's what we're ministers of. And we want you to respect the word, not each of us. Just to count us as conveyors of it. This is why here, especially in the end times, the famine is not for bread, but it's for hearing the word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. You have very few ministries that will really teach the word of God whereby it flows as God gave it to us, whether they like to pick at it. And, and um, that does not let the Holy Spirit flow into the deeper truths, that is to say, the mysteries of God of all three earth ages, why we're here, and so forth. He's already told them in chapter 3, you can't afford the mystery or the meat. I have to still feed you milk. Verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, that, that he's trustworthy. You can count on what he says. He's not going to tell you one thing and then change it. If he states it, you, you can depend on it. And if you're a true minister, that's exactly what you do. You do your homework until you know beyond a doubt that what you're teaching can be trusted. Why? Trusted because it's the Word of God, the truth of God. And truth changes lives. You know, you never want to put your own thoughts in God's truths because you're, you, could, you could wreck a soul. You could really hurt somebody. Well, how, how do you know that? Because God knows the deeper mysteries and the truth is it should be given. That's why you should teach it verse by verse. Verse 3, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. In other words, you should never judge anyone. That's a, that's a big sin. But, but be set for it. Anytime you set out to teach God's Word and you do it properly and, and you teach it as God would have you teach it, um, you're going to have people that will judge you. Boy, will they judge you. But you disregard anything but God the judge. Uh, number one, if God gives you a truth and it's from his word, it doesn't matter what man might say. It's what God says and what God thinks that is important. You don't worry a whole lot about what men would think they could judge. You see, 
man cannot tell what you're thinking and you cannot tell what another man is thinking. God knows your thoughts. That's what qualifies him to judge. You can't con him. You can't put anything over on him. His judgment is sure and accurate, whereas man just guesses in the dark. Paul is saying, hey, how could, you, how could you judge me? I can't even judge myself necessarily. So that, that would kind of put it at odds, wouldn't it? Paul knew he was judged because God struck him down on the road to Damascus that day. Got his attention big time. Verse 4, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. I, by myself, I, I could say nothing. I probably would know nothing. Why? By itself, he was a destroyer of the church. But by God's hand, he was struck down, converted, instilled the Holy Spirit within him, whereby he taught God's Word and wrote most, a lot of the New Testament at God's hand, of course. But God would use this one. Verse 5, Therefore, judge nothing, or, or you criticize nothing, before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, that mystery, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, that's your very mind, and then shall every man have praise of God. Why? Because God is always fair. This is the reason God can judge. He can judge fairly because, again, He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you deserve, and I guarantee you, you're always going to get everything you got coming to you. The good, the bad, the ugly. If you have good coming to you, you're going to have good. If you've got ugly coming to you, hey, you're going to get it. You can count on it. If you haven't repented of it, uh, get ready. It's going to happen. Why? Because God knows your very thoughts. That's why He is judge. That's why He created us as, as He did. And do you know, this is why it makes our Father so happy when you submit to Him, when you understand that, and you humbly come before Him and let Him use you to what? To further the Word, to further the truth. That is, to help somebody that needs help, that is, is in ignorance concerning the deeper mysteries of God's Word in the milk, skimming along, most of them wouldn't even know there was a first age before this, even though science declares it over and over and over. They don't take the time to check it out in the manuscripts and realize God declared it himself long ago that there was an earth age before this when dinosaurs roamed the hills, the mammoth roamed, that palm trees grew in New Mexico. We found them petrified there in documentaries. Reason for it, because then came the destruction of that first earth age, and, and then God brought in this one to find out whether you're going to love God or Satan. It's your choice. That's why he's the judge. Verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against, um, one against another. It, um, you, um, you realize that we're all equal. You can't puff yourself up and say, well, I, I be a Paul. Paul's a deeper teacher. No, that doesn't matter. It's all the same word. You can't puff yourself up and play favorites. It's, they're one ministry. It's the ministry of God. And God gives to his ministers what they can handle. And in doing so, it's all equal. Why? Because it all comes from God. It is from our Heavenly Father. You, you don't play favorites and, and uh, you let them all become in one word, and that is the word of God. <clears throat> Verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? Question. And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? What have you got that God didn't give you in the first place? What are, you, what are you puffed up and bragging about it for? God gave it to you. Now, if thou didst receive it, 
why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Why, why do you make out like you had a dream in the night and it all came to you and God didn't give it to you? You know, there are some people that would do that. They, oh, yes, that's my teaching. No, it's God's teaching. This is a very serious thing as far as our Father is concerned, if you want His blessings, is to know that all truth flows from Him and the love that He brings forth in that Word, that it's all equal. <clears throat> Whom God, you might say, well, it seems a little unfair. No, Whom God gives much, He expects much. Whom God gives little, He expects little and calls it even. Calls it equally blessed. Both are going to get blessed exactly the same. Why? Because God gave it all for a purpose, for a reason, for the destiny of God's children overall to be taught that truth equally. Verse 8. Now, ye are full. That's to say your little churches down here that you've set up, they're full. He doesn't say full of what. Okay. Now ye are rich, or you think you are. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we also might reign with you. Now, um, you can be sure that if we were there, we'd reign with you all right, reign something down on our head. In other words, some people have to think, well, this is my little church and I'm it and this is it. And then they, they cut God out. They put a crown on themselves and reign as a king. This is the word of God by so-and-so. This is Joe Blow's ministry. Oh, I didn't know Joe. I, you know, I've read a lot of scripture, but I've never read that Joe Blow had a ministry. I know our father does. And it's well if all follow it. Man better keep his name away from a ministry. Or it's God's ministry. And he treats all equally. Don't play church. Verse 9, for I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world. That's the way they will treat us. And to angels and to men. In other words, they stare at us when we bring forth the truth, but who cares? You know, a lot of people, when you say there was a first earth age, even that alone will cause snickers. How ignorant can you be? Many people are. And not realizing there was a first, first earth age. Why, why, you can't, there's no way that you could understand why people are on earth today in the flesh if you didn't understand what happened back in the first earth age and it's written right here in the scripture. That's the mystery part of it. And yet it's so simple. A child can understand it. I know that upsets some, but so help me, God, it's the truth. When God in, enlightens and when God opens your eyes, your spiritual eyes and ears to hear the truth, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. It's what God's Word says, because that is the way it's going down. Verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake. Christianity, they smirk, they make light of. But we are wise in Christ. Wisdom comes from Him. We are weak in the flesh, we are. But ye are, but ye are strong, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Many times you, you think when you stay clear of it, uh, but when we declare the truth, they, they will... Um, uh, look at us as weak. They're not. Why? They have the power of God. They're not weak at all. Don't ever, don't ever let that little thought enter your mind. For they, they as human flesh are weak, but God protects them. God looks over them. God strengthens them. And, and so it is. The enemy, and much of this said in irony by Paul. He's, he's kind of ribbing them a little bit. Okay, verse 11. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked. 
Naked is a wrong translation. It means we're, we're not dressed up as fancy as you all are. Why? We're traveling. We don't, we don't have a wardrobe right with us the way you all do. And are buffeted. They, they, it's a rough old trip out there on those highways and byways. And have no certain dwelling place. We, we don't have a home to put our little old heads down every night to keep our hair combed properly. It's... Um, it, even at that present hour when God's word was reigning supreme, his disciples had a kind of a rough old cut at it. And I wonder how many Christians there would be today if you still had to go through this to bring forth the word of God. Verse 12, and labor, working with our own hands. Paul was a tent maker. That's the way he cut it. Being reviled, that's to say they curse at us. We bless, we bless them back in turn. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Patience, patiently, we suffer the very slander and persecution that they bring upon us. Why? The power of God is with them. You know, how humble Paul was to have God's hand upon him, struck down, chosen especially, promised by God that he was a chosen vessel. And yet at the same time, he brought forth the ministry in this way. You know, it was dangerous out on those byways. But they could cut it. Why? God was with them. Verse 13, being defamed, this means slandered. I mean, their name drug in the mud. We entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the off scourging. You know what that is? That's the garbage. We're the garbage of all things unto this day. In the, we're saying this is the way the eyes of the world are. That's the way they judge. How wrong they can be. True knowledge is a beautiful thing, and the truth will always set you free in knowing God's Word and His leadership and what He has in store for us in that third earth age, which is the eternity. And guess what? Guess what's going to happen in that eternity? Uh, this, these um, off scourging and and um, and uh, this defaming and cursing—they're not going to be there. Okay, they're going to be gone. Those that do not convert, and you know, it is wonderful that you can have honor in your heart that even though somebody may badmouth you. And even though somebody might think they're taking advantage of you, with deep in your heart, you know if it's possible you want to see their souls saved because they're children of God. And that's why God blesses you. Is you're patient and long-suffering and you strive to teach that truth in hopes that they will convert, they will come to the truth, they will repent and be followers of God. And, um, and so it is. Now listen carefully. Verse 14. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. I want you to be on guard. I, I want you to expect it. Well, well, you know, dear brother, I, I always thought if you was a minister, everybody glad-handed you. And everything was just precious, and the, the beloved brotherhood just carried you right on. Oh, how, how wrong you would be out in the world. Because um, they, uh, you are laughed at, <clears throat> you are made light of, and atheists have a big joke with you, and that's fine. It's to their own um, damnation. But what he's saying here is, I, I want to warn you. I, I want you to be set in advance. You know, what is he saying? I don't want you to be some hothouse lily that's going to march out there in the first opposition, you're gone. Okay. I want to toughen you up a little bit. I want, you to, I want you to know how it is to be a strong Christian. What it all amounts to, you can cut it. You're a can-do type person. A little wrinkle in the feathers will not bother you one iota. You can look them straight in the eye and know that God is with you 
You have the victory and you're marching forward. And that's the way it should be. So he said, I'm warning you. It's not a pretty picture all the way, but it's pretty. And when you know in your heart, God is with us. 15. For though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. You may have a thousand people there that want to tell you what Christ means to you. Now, now I, I want you to think this through because a lot of people would, they would quit before they absolutely thought it all the way through. He said, you, you got all kinds of, of instructors out there. But who converted the church to start with that is the father spiritually? Now, there you have the clue. Don't, don't jump to conclusions here until you think it through. Because Paul brought the word, but whose word was it? Okay. Let's think it through. Well, of course, it was God's word. So we have one Father, all right, and He's in heaven. He's watching over us, and He uses Paul in that way. And it doesn't matter how many instructors you have, there's only one Father, that's the living God. And don't you ever forget it. He sent one, which is to say the Son, Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean again now? Yahweh's Savior, the Anointed One, that's the door. You've got to go through that door or you're not going. <clears throat> so um, sometimes um, it takes a little bit of thought to get down to oneness. Or you're going to, as you see, Paul's leaving that so you could make a big, you could make Paul a, a big number there. But that's not what Paul wants you to draw from it. Okay. There's only one God. That's the point. He's our Father. 16, wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. You imitate what I do, and I am sold out to that one. I'm sold out to God because he sent that son to me on the road to Damascus, knocked me down, converted me, and I am sold out. I could never do anything other than serve the living God, and he is the father of all. Father of all, why? Well, in, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls belong to me, God says. Why? Because he created them, they're his, to do with as he chooses. Verse 17, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, or Timothy, who is my beloved son, spiritually speaking, and faithful in the Lord. I mean, you can count on what he says. Who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. I don't change that message. I, I don't change one message here or some way and go over here and teach another way. You know, th this is the way, you watch out for ministers, and, and he's teaching here, and don't you overlook it. Some, some, we have a saying in the South, he's anybody's dog that'll hunt with him, okay? Which means, whatever crowd he's in, he's going he's gonna, to uh, tickle their fancy with words. He's going to say what they want him to say. Doesn't matter what God's Word says. He knows the crowd. He knows what they want to hear. And he's going to sugarcoat their little fancies, and he's worthless. Paul is saying, hey, I don't care where I am. I don't care who I'm talking to. They all get the same message, and it is a message of God. We have one God, thousands of instructors, one truth, one God, and follow him. Follow me because I follow him. There's no other way out. And so it is. What a, what a teacher this Paul was. How, how humble. You know, what would happen with a lot of people if they had a following like Paul did? Man, they would start them a, a church. They wouldn't travel around being roughed up everywhere they would go. They would have thousands would attend and just put him on a pedestal. And, and oh, I mean, he, he could have had, talk about being a king and reigning right there as he said they're trying to do earlier. 
<clears throat> he could have done it. But no, he was a tent maker. He still made tents. He, he didn't live off of these people. He made tents wherever he went. That's, that's Aquila and Priscilla were both tent makers. That's one of the, I guess, the reason they kind of buddied up. And then, but mainly because God had them to and God used them. And especially Priscilla, boy, how he used her. But uh, he did not see fit to make anything out of himself other than to teach God's Word. And do you know something? That's why God gives you the Word, when you'll teach it instead of yourself. When you will teach that Word that He gives you, whereby people, spiritual eyes can see, their spiritual ears can hear, the simplicity in which God Himself, our Father, one God, brings us the message and the Savior, whereby you have that saving grace and God overlooks. How, how, how precious he, it is that He loves His children. No, Paul didn't teach a different message everywhere he went. Just one, the Word of God. And do you know something? Even to this day, because of Paul's honesty and straightforwardness in writing these let letters to, the, to Corinth and to Thessalonica and to the Colossae and to many other places, those letters are still taught. And do you know something? He's telling the truth. They all say the same message. It's the message of God. Not different sprinkled here for one group or different from another group. God's Word, straight on, straight forward, something that is palatable can be heard by all people. Verse 18 to continue. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. Some, some of you just keep on doing what you're doing. Say, He's not coming. We can do whatever we want to. We'll just, we'll just start our own little thing here. Puffed up means you are proud and bragging in, in yourself, okay? Self-righteous. We, we can get her done. All right. They're not listening, in other words. Verse 19, but I will come to you shortly. If the Lord will, now I want you to note that, if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. And what power is that? The Word of God. That's what it amounts to. What that, um, the very power of God. Now, I always pray, Paul made a statement. I'm coming to you shortly if God will, if the Lord wills. Always pray God's will, okay? You don't want anything if God doesn't want it. You, and that should be one of the first lines in your prayer request always. Father, if it's your will. Why? Because he knows what's best for you. And he wants what's best for you. You could ask for some dumb thing that could get you in more trouble than you can get out of. And if you do, he's not going to give it to you if you're in good standing with him. Therefore, always ask his will. That's what Paul does here. Uh, if it's God's will, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be there shortly. And it won't be um, uh, not the speech of them that are puffed up, that are a bunch of braggarts, but the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit heals, guides, directs, changes thoughts. Sometimes you can't change thoughts. But if it has to do with your destiny and God's will, God can take their little old minds and... He can tweak them just like that and change minds and hearts to get his word done, okay? And um, that's why Paul is saying, those puffed up ones don't bother me one iota. Verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. You need to grab a hold of that real well. The kingdom, well, what does that mean exactly? It's the king in his dominion and it's everywhere. He is our king, and, and um, it's, it uh, is not just the word, but it's the power that goes with it. And, and when you execute that power, claim it, demand it, 
stand for it, then that power is with you. You see, Christ gave you power over all of your enemies in the satanic force. You don't have to worry about it. Why would you get uptight about it? You're protected through the Holy Spirit. You want, you want to know where the proof of that is? It's, uh, you will find it in the great book of Luke, chapter 10, beginning with verse 19. I give you power over all your enemies, including Satan, the serpent, scorpions, all the things of the book of Revelation that bring in the hard times for God's elect. You got power over them, so what are you sweating? You don't have to sweat anything. Why? The king and his dominion is not only word, but his word is power. Verse 21, to complete the chapter, what will you question? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? It's up to you. You're going to get what you got coming to you. If you continue being puffed up, rest assured, Paul will be there with the rod. You might say, well, that's, you know, and the little bleeding heart Christians today say, oh, gracious God, forgive. Jesus wouldn't do that. Oh, well, it's his order. Don't you know what love is? He will come in love anyway because tough love, it's bearing a rod. Otherwise, who would care? Who cares about the puffed up ones? Push them off in the ditch, get rid of them. You don't want them anyway? Well, a true Christian does if we can convert them. So you got to put the rod to them a little bit every once in a while. And, and um, righteous indignation comes forth. And there is a bit of correction there for a puffed up one. Bring them right on down to God's level, which is power in the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, it would frighten me to live in this generation with this, in this world, with the things, the events that are transpiring, if I did not know that the power of God through the Holy Spirit was with us. It would be a frightening thing. But with His power, we're comfortable. We're at ease. We have the victory. Do you know who you can thank for that? Your father. There's just one. Don't, don't, you got a thousand instructors? Maybe. But you got one father, his word, and his power. Listen to it. Let him know you love him. It pays great dividends. All right. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We don't judge people. As, today, as today's lecture goes, God is the judge. We judge no man. Uh, but uh, God certainly does. You do have the right for spiritual discernment to know who to listen to, though. Listen to your Father. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, you've got a prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. 
he loves you. He may not love what you do always, um, but he does love you and he wants that love return. If you want part of that power, you must love him and let him know. That makes his day. You can read in the last verse of Revelation chapter 4, he created all things for his pleasure. That means you. You either give him pleasure or you're probably not going to receive any blessings, okay? It's that simple. Let him know you love him. That pleasures him. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with... <clears throat> Marie from Texas, if I can't understand the book of Revelation, what other book in the Bible can I read that uh, is like Revelation? No, no, I, I don't want you to go there. I want, if, if, you, if, if you've had my tapes on Revelation, I don't think you probably have, study it with me. You can order the book of Revelation or it'll be taught, it'll be a while before it's taught on television, but it will be again. <clears throat> but until then, it's better that you order the tapes or CDs and let me lead you through Revelation because it means to reveal. God wants you to know what it says. It's important. It's simple. But sometimes you need a teacher and to, to take you through it, that word. So uh, I, I don't want you to go somewhere else because... If you can't understand the revealing, you have a problem, but I know you can. Uh, and with my help, I know certainly that you can, and I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, you could, I could tell you that uh, the book of Daniel is simply an overlay of the book of Revelation, but if you didn't understand Revelation, you sure wouldn't understand Daniel. So you need a little bit of help there, and that'll get it for you. Robert from Illinois. You said Satan will be released this year, 2012. Can you please explain this more? I did not say that. Okay. The only thing you could have heard me say is that we're in the generation of the fig tree and Satan will be released during that generation. But uh, the year certainly was not mentioned. I, I know a lot of people are getting nervous about December of 2012 because the Mayan calendar ends there, so it, but it's just the end of a segment, okay? It's supposed to start over then uh, again, but uh, it will be interesting to see what happens there, an interesting time, but I did not say Satan would come this year. He will come to this generation because we're in the generation of the fig tree. Uh, Stacy from North Carolina, um, okay, when teaching the book of Jeremiah, you mentioned that there are pictograms, pictograms, okay, in, in the Bible. I don't, I didn't catch the verses or meaning, so can you please, uh, where they are located in the Bible, and please explain how to do our homework on searching and edifying the pictograms. It's, it's not picture grams, it's pictogram, okay? And what are pictograms? Okay, it, it is the particular one you're talking about is Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 26. A pictogram, and it's done two times. It's done again, and if I remember right, in the 51st chapter. And it is the word translated shishak, shishak. Now, wh wh what makes it a pictogram is they take the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet and make it the first, and make the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet the last, and so on and so forth until it, it makes, could we say, a crossword puzzle, okay? In other words, there's a hidden message within it. What, what it ends up actually being is BBL, which is what? Babylon. It's Babel or confusion. And uh, that's what the pictogram is. Well, why would God do that? He wants your attention. He wants you to understand there are a little deeper truths. So he makes it a pictogram. And th there are two of them. There's more than that, but two using Shishak. And that's how you will find it. If you have a companion Bible, it explains that for you in the column, the side column. You see, 
some English people are not great scholars in, in, in Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek, but the person who put together the Companion Bible was a fantastic scholar in both Aramaic and Hebrew and in Greek. He was so good at translating that he is the only Christian that Ginsburg allowed to proofread the Masaba. Okay, uh, that's saying a lot. That may not mean a lot to some people, but that's a that's a that's tall cotton. Okay, and certainly um, that that uh, edifies and God leads, God directs, and how good it is. But a companion Bible would help you on that. Okay, Peter from North Carolina. Pastor Murray, thank you and your sons and staff. You're welcome. If the elect are going to blow Satan's cover as Christ, why would he even bother with them? If I were him, I would run from the elect and ignore them. Does he have to deal with the elect because it's God's orders? No, you, you, you underestimate Satan. How much of the world do you think Satan has following him? Practically all of it. Do you think, I mean, he's supernatural. He thinks that he's good enough. He can have the, even the elect eating right out of his hand. You see, you're underestimating him. He's going to go for you to win your heart, buddy. So you, you want to be set for that, all right? That's, he thinks he's that good. And why wouldn't he? Most of the world whores after him. They think he's a great guy. <clears throat> and laugh at Christians. Okay, we got um, Noreen from Louisiana. My question is this. I am aware not to wish good tidings and so forth to those who follow false teachings, but what about my wishing my boss a nice day off when he comes, uh, does not have to work? It, it, it's, you know, you have to use... God places convictions on people. That means he lets you know when he doesn't want you to do it. It seems to me like your boss is pushing religion at work, don't you? That's a mistake. That's where you make your uh, livelihood. That's where you make your income so you can teach God's word somewhere else and plant seeds and everything. Don't do it at work. But um, I, what I'm telling you, don't fall into his trap, okay? He may, uh, he's a little bit on the ignorant side, <clears throat> so uh, you can, you, you're big enough that you can, you can live with that and you can figure it out, okay? But sometimes you have, to, you have to make your own decision, and so it is. But you're doing good. I'm proud of you. Scott from Wisconsin, you're welcome. Thank you for... I have... I have stage four living colon cancer. I don't know how much time I have left, but could you answer these questions on the air? Thank you. How do I properly repent? All you gotta do is tell him, Father, I repent of this so it's erased from the book of life and have a change of heart, you know? I know you have a change of heart or you wouldn't be wanting to repent. All you gotta do is let him know, Father, I'm sorry, I did it. And I. I if I cannot tolerate chemo anymore, is that okay with God? I, I cannot take being sick or suffering anymore. But hey, Scott, you know what? It's your ship. You're the one sailing her. But do you know, like in today's lecture, I said always pray for God's will. If God still has a purpose here for you, uh, even if, if you stop the chemo, if, if, if it's making you that sick where you're not having any quality of life, then if God still has a purpose for you, he'll fix it without it. Now, I'm not saying he will do that, but I'm saying that's what happens when you pray with God's will. But, uh, old partner, what I'm telling you is your body is your ship. You're the captain of it. Don't you let somebody else tell you within what you really want to do. You talk it over with the Father and you go for it. You, you sail your own ship. Don't you put her on the rock, but you, you sail her proudly and bring her forth with God's will, okay? Rich from New York. I'm very, very upset about my wife leaving me with my best friend. She left without any word to me, just up and left me. I struggle immensely daily with not being able to forgive either one of them. 
I want to, but I haven't been able to. I've, I've been over six months now. What should I do? Well, hey, why, why, why are you worried about them? They're not fit for you. You, you don't, why, why let them bother you? You deserve better, okay? You, you deserve better than those two. Why would you let them upset your life and, um, and, and everything when they're not fit to worry about, okay? Trash is trash, okay, if that be the case. So I'm just helping you to get your head screwed on right so that you go on, that God has something much more important for you. And you go for it, okay? Sorry this happened, but it happens in life. And, and if somebody's not good enough for you, sometimes God takes them out of your life. Be that as it may, and that's one way to look at it. Barbara from North Carolina. My question is about children who die before the age of accountability. I am in a Bible study group, and they believe that children are innocent and are thus saved because of their innocency of or age. Don't we all have to account to the Father for our salvation and decide to love and follow Him? I think this decision is made during the millennium. Please give me scripture to document and do children under age of accountability have an angel? But have you, haven't you ever read Matthew 19, verse 14 and 15? What did it say? They were kind of telling Jesus, they thought, well, He's tired. Get those kids out of here. Get, get, them, get them back. Get the children back. He said, if you stop, don't you ever suffer the little children to come to me. That means you bring them forth. Don't you dare try to drive them away from me. And he brought those little children forth, and what did he do? This is important. And I'm sure it's the 15th verse that he laid hands on them. If Jesus lays hands on children or anyone else, hey, they're home free, friend. So uh, I hope that helps you. God is so fair that innocent is innocent. That means exactly that. Um, they, uh, there, are, there are some people, you see, maybe what you're forgetting is there are some people that are just too good for this earth age, and sometimes Young people are taken home, I believe, for that very reason. God loves them. But it isn't because they didn't earn it and have to wait till the millennium. They earned it in the first earth age. Okay. I, I will stop there. Uh, Patty from Florida. My question is simply, I suppose, but I was wondering if the beautiful bouquet of floral arrangement that you have behind you, if they are fresh flowers, the reason I am asking is because I have been told that it's biblical to biblical order to have fresh flowers to offer up to God when we come before Him or, or the church settings. Well, when you look like I do, you got to have things on the set that kind of help out, okay? They are real, they are fresh, and they're beautiful, and uh, they, they maybe even make me look good. And, and I'm, I know God is pleased with them. Thanks for asking, but they are, they're real flowers and God, just beautiful. We thank our Father for all of his nature. Annette from Ohio, Arnett from Ohio. I was brought up in a Christian home. I was baptized when I was 15. I think of myself as a backslider. What must I do? I have always believed. Repent. That's all you have to do is you can't be saved again. Once you're saved, that's it. Christ does the saving. He doesn't fail. You can drift so far away from the salvation backsliding, you can go to hell. But don't ask God to die on the cross again, as it states in Hebrews 6, to save you. He's already done his part. Now you have to do yours. Repent and let him know He forgive you, that he will forgive you and let him know you love him. My ex-wife passed and was cremated. It was her choice. That's fine, no problem. That's this. This she's already with the father, and and the body's back to dust. Uh, Rachel from Oklahoma. Can you tell me when a child becomes old enough to be held accountable for the? 
their choices, no one can ever give me a definite answer. You have blessed us by teaching me, and I am sharing with my children. Well, thank you. Well, uh, when a child becomes accountable, that means when they know that Christ died on the cross for our sins, and when they make a commitment to him, and, and with full knowledge. If you ever see uh, baptisms by the chapel, if you see a real young child being baptized, you will note whichever pastor is baptizing that child will usually talk to them a second. You won't be able to hear it, most likely. But it's to determine if the child is accountable. And uh, uh, I would never, you know, Many people would say, well, we just don't. If they're not 12 years old, we're not going to baptize them. Well, how, how would you feel if a six-year-old that loved the Lord, and bless your hearts, we've got a lot of five and six years old and even younger that study with us in the simplicity that Christ teaches that are very accountable. They know more about the Word than a lot of adults because of proper teaching. But how would you feel if you were a pastor and a six-year-old that felt a cannibal asked to be baptized and you refused and on the road home there was an accident and they were killed? How, how, would, how would you handle that? I mean, really, before God, how would you answer? So uh, it's best not to judge people, and it is best to know that accountability is uh, I, I know some six-year-olds that know a lot more Bible than somebody 60, some people 60 years old. Be that as it may, Laura Lee from Pennsylvania, we do not know if there are or will be more intruders. An intruder enters our home, will, will not leave when asked or told. I want to back up. A situation occurred that could happen in my world, so I would like to know what correctly to do. My intruder enters the home and will not leave when told. We do not know if there are or will be more intruders. We do not know if they are armed or could use something in the room to harm us. We do know that persons and others can overpower us. We wonder if after, if after seeing they will leave people who can ID them alive in the room. There is more than one person that can kill if killing should be take place. Question, we wonder if a window of opportunity opens, do we or can we kill them considering the above? And if this happens in a place in the community, do rules apply morally as home or, you know, it's, have you ever read uh, first, Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. A person that won't protect your own family is worse than an infidel. Okay. Uh, um, Laura Lee, don't ever, uh, you know, always obey, obey your civil laws. Okay. Because there are some places you're not allowed to have a weapon. But there are more equalizers than a gun. There's crossbows. There's things, don't, don't, don't let somebody enter your home and bother your children. You did not invite them in. They are worthless or they would not be there. And always make certain that you know who it, that you know it's not a relative or somebody like that. Usually, <clears throat> I have a, a, a way that if you hear somebody breaking into your home or coming into your home at night, a flash of light always startles a person. I don't care who they are. So you take your weapon, if it's legal in your state, and um, most states now have a permit to carry concealed, or at least any, most any state has the right to protect your own home, armed citizens, or as it should be. And go to a light switch, and when that door is broken through, flip that light on, it will startle them. They will probably throw their hands up. And if they are already in your house and it's obvious they have weapons in hand or something and it's not old Uncle Peck uh, or somebody else that's drunker and three sheets in the wind, you know, uh, all confused, then that's it. Protect your family. It's, you have every right to do that, okay? Don't let someone abuse your family. 
Get rid of them. Okay. Um, you know, crime really goes down in states like Arkansas where many of us have permits to carry. Okay. I mean, criminals, when we're armed and can take care of business, they don't want anything to do with us. And that's good judgment on their part. Uh, Gloria from Wisconsin. Uh, okay, when we pass from this earth and go to paradise, do we communicate with others who are all also awaiting judgment? Sure, you know your family that's already passed on and so forth. Uh, and uh, communication, communicate, communicate. <clears throat> God is not the God of the dead, but the living. And they are very much alive, even though the flesh is turned back to dust, that person is very much alive with the Father in paradise. Or on the opposite side of paradise, and they're communicating too, probably crying a lot in, in their um, coffin. Uh, well, they don't have a coffin in paradise, okay? They're, they can't afford one. They're just there. We know they don't have any clothing on necessarily because they don't have any righteous acts. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, they're there and that's it. And I'm going to have to get to this one in, in the next uh, broadcast. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. <clears throat> Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it's the letter He's written to you. And when you read it and study it, <clears throat> excuse me, and take it to heart, it makes His day. And when you, and I'm talking to you, make His day, God's day, boy, is He going to bless you. You can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important, though, you listen to me. You stay in His Word every day. In His Word, when you stay in it, it's a good day. You know why? Even with trouble? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.